Well, actually, the problem with safehold is that between one thing and another, between concussions, between projects, other projects, and everything else, um, I haven't started the next safehold book yet. I should have handed it in a minimum of eight months ago, and I haven't even started it yet. Sorry, guys. Uh, I know exactly what I'm going to do with it when I when I start it. Just getting to I'm it. I'm just getting to it. Uh, but yeah. that is my next solo writing project. Um, and um, this story arc should be shorter than the original story arc. The story arc that got us to the defeat of the of the temple uh, took like what nine books to get there. Okay, so the tenth book, it's kind of a transition book. And okay. some people haven't liked it as much because one criticism I got on the, the earlier books is that uh, you know the last couple did not cover as much time frame as like uh, one of well, like Armageddon Reef, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the reason for that was that the canvas had gotten really, really big. There was a lot going on. I'm fighting literally a world war uh, in uh, on a world with sailing ships and, and whatnot. Uh, I'm throwing around armies the size that you didn't see in our world until after internal combustion had been able to take over from the horse and whatnot because they've got the dragons and mm. the canal system and everything else. So you you have to slow down a little bit uh, when you're doing when you're doing that. Okay, the book that uh, the Through Fiber Trials that uh, has been out now for two years plus. Um, it, it's it it covers a gap of almost twenty years in one book. Okay, so to do that. You have to move much more quickly through the events that are, are taking place. And at least one person has said, yeah, it sounds you know, like he mailed it in. He wasn't interested in what was happening. I was very interested in what was happening. And I was giving you substantial amounts of, of detail for the aspects of it that I was covering at all. Mm-hmm. Okay, other parts of it were like, okay, well, while this was happening, this happened over here kind of thing. Um, and the purpose of that book was to set up the final on safe hold story arc, which I am currently estimating at maybe another three books. Um, there's room for that to, that to shift. But um, at the end of this book, they've gotten past the the window, uh, their predicted window for the archangel's return, kind of thing. Uh, so they're they've got. I think that their estimate is that they have a minimum of like seventy years before the next time chop on when okay, when yeah. Schuler might have been talking about. Uh, so they've got, okay, we can work with this, you know, but in the meantime, they've also found out sort of in passing that apparently there's a lot more stuff under the temple than they thought was under the temple, um, which is maybe not a great thing, you know, uh, and they've also, I mean, the, one of the purposes of this book was to deal with the fact that in any, uh, fundamental paradigm shift. There are winners and losers. There are people for whom it works out really well, and there are people for whom it's one of the worst things that ever happened. And with the combination of the the internal vicious religious warfare aspects uh, that Sittermark had to deal with, uh, plus the change in economies, plus, you know, um, Sittermark is in serious financial trouble and it never quite gets squared away. Mm. It's kind of, it's making ground and then it loses ground kind mm-hmm. of thing. 
Um, and ultimately, what knocks the blocks out from under the, the republic's economy in, in, through fiery trials is for all intents and purposes a stock scam um, that starts the, the, the run on the banks, which are not as, as um, they're not as well monetized. They don't have the reserves that they really ought to have. And the Republic's been working on that. They've got the new central bank, the whole nine yards. But they're not there yet. Okay. Mm-hmm. And they, they, they aren't like, uh, the folks like, uh, the, um, the, uh, Western provinces of, uh, Harchong, uh, which become the United Provinces after the, after the, the rebellion kicks off. Uh, they don't have really an economy. Okay. So they start out by adopting the Charisian model. Okay, so they, they're going in, they're building the banks, they're building the stock laws, they, they recognize the necessity of a rule of law, you know, the whole nine yards. Mm-hmm. So because they're starting from the ground up, they don't have all of the vested interest groups trying to prevent them from doing the reforms that need to be done to stabilize an economy. Okay, Sittermark has very strong domestic political institutions, but they've been pushed to the max in the war. And they are particularly um, harmed by the collapse of the House of Clinton, which was effectively the central bank of the Republic, even though nobody knew that it was, that that was what it was doing. Uh But it was the, the, uh, the, because of its size, because of its influence, uh, because of its connections, it was the one that was effectively setting interest rates and, and, and that sort of thing. And it, but it had grown up organically. It hadn't been created to do that job. And so when it collapsed, it took people a while to realize what it had been doing and to try and find another way to fix it. In the meantime, you've got these banks that have been issuing worthless paper and whatnot. They don't want anybody to fix the system because if they fix the system, they'll be driven out of business, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So one of the functions of this book is to deal with the fact that most authors, when they create a society or whatever, they tend to create societies that work better than societies really do. Okay. Because nobody wants to really write about societies that stumble along the way that they right. really stumble along. I mean, you can look at where we are right now with the kind of hyper partisanship that we've got. Um, it makes good books, but you don't want to live through it. Okay. Um, I, somebody, I, I, I think it was Poole Anderson, uh, who said, uh, an adventure is uh, someone else being cold, tired, hungry, and terrified far, far away from you. Yeah. <laughs> That's an adventure. <laughs> okay. It's not an adventure that happens to you. All right. Well, the, the function of this book was to deal with the consequences of... The, the the changes that got brought about by this huge war mm-hmm. and by the Charisian change in attitudes towards the church and whatnot. It also gave me an opportunity to demonstrate that uh, the Church of God Awaiting is not necessarily an inherently evil institution. Okay. Um, one of the big thrusts of, of uh, the earlier books was that power corrupts, okay? Um, and that you had people who were, in theory, men and women of God, but who were actually men and women of the system that they were gaming. That mm-hmm. they were, yeah. And that it was not, I mean, okay, Jasper Clinton, no matter how you cut it, he was evil. 
Okay. I never hung a villain I enjoyed hanging more than him. 